No matter the height of his success, Steve Schwarzman isn't satisfied. Straight out of Harvard Business School, Schwarzman joined Lehman Brothers, where he rose to managing director at just 31 years old. He left it behind in 1985 to co-found the private equity firm Blackstone Group, which raised $830 million for its first fund. The company has since grown into a giant, with $512 billion in assets under management and 23 offices worldwide. Schwarzman is here to talk about what his investments reveal about where the economy is right now and where it's headed. Hello and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to our guest, Stephen Schwarzman, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Blackstone Group. Steve, great to see you. Good to see you, Andy. So I want to start off by asking you about a recent gift you made, $350 million to MIT to help create the Stephen A. Schwarzman College of Computing. And my understanding is it's all about AI. So the question is, why MIT and why AI? Well, why MIT is one of, they're one of the greatest, if not the greatest, scientific university in the world uh, with huge numbers of Nobel Prize winners and Turing Prize winners. Uh, but uh, MIT was a vehicle in a way. Uh, you know, the, the gift there enables them to double their faculty uh, in, in the uh, computer science area, uh, set up a new college, uh, and have uh, uh, faculty members uh, as links to the other schools of, a, uh, of MIT. So, so what this will enable MIT to do is become the first AI-enabled university in the world. Everyone at MIT will be able to have those skills. Uh, and, and you know, the reason also for MIT uh, was, was because um, uh, they, they, they will be focused on the ethics uh, of the introduction of these technologies, which are extremely powerful and could, on the negative side, um, uh, create uh, higher levels of um, uh, unemployment, uh, people being replaced by computers and machines, uh, and that's sort of the fear. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the good side, uh, these, these uh, technologies will do remarkable things for human beings in terms of education, in terms of medicine, uh, improving the time to market for medicines, lowering the cost, uh, procedures being cheaper, more accurate, all kinds of wonderful things in almost every area of society. So, so the, what, what, what was important for me in the ethics area is to make sure, unlike the internet, which has got a lot of good things but has encouraged bullying and uh, fake news and all kinds of odd behaviors which are not controllable. Uh, that, 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 you know, we do things the right way. Uh, and my other objective with that gift uh, was to increase U.S. competitiveness. And if we were going to double the faculty uh, in computer science and, uh, uh, at MIT, it was quite clear to me that the other great universities in the United States would, would dramatically increase their budgets uh, and raise outside money because who wants anyone to get ahead of them? Right, right. Uh, and, and then if we get both of those things to happen, then engaging the U.S. government uh, to put up very significant monies to advance these technologies is the way we used to do things in the past with the you know, space launches and you know, competing with Sputnik in the 1950s. Uh, we, we, we need uh, a more robust uh, national policy. Other countries are doing the same thing uh, and it's a bit of a wake up call. So, so that gift, uh, at least in my mind, uh, has, has basically uh, you know, created, has the potential to create all of these positive things uh, for the country and, and looks like uh, that's on track to happen. So really AI was an area that had the most potential for a multiplier effect, it sounds like. I mean, of all the things that you could have picked, is that kind of... I reasoning? think that's right because it's not just AI. There, there's other technologies like quantum computing 
that are uh, exceptionally profound uh, in terms of their impact. Uh, and, and, you know, all this moves into robotics and other types of things. When you take the whole complex together, it's, it's transformative for the workplace, uh, for the country, and ironically, uh, challenging and important for mankind. So th this is like big field uh, and important, and that, that's why, you know, I, I've engaged with it. You mentioned uh, technology writ large and the foibles that exist there. Do you think that uh, social networks and ad platforms and such, like Facebook and, and the like, need more regulation at this point, Steve? I, th I think they think they need more regulation. And from hanging around uh, with, with some of the major uh, you know, participants in the tech uh, business now, uh, it, it's quite clear that regulation is coming one way or another. For the U.S. tech companies, and uh, I meet with these people, they talk about why, why are the tech standards uh, be, being created by Europeans right. at, at a time when Europeans don't have an entrant into the whole industry. And, and we have to fashion what's appropriate uh, for the industry because we have the leading companies in those industries. So I, I don't think there's um, um, reluctance uh, to, to deal with a regulatory issue. It all depends how it's done. Yeah, it's interesting because I think when they didn't want regulation, the dysfunction in Washington was beneficial, but now that they see the need for it, it's not helpful like it is for so many businesses, right? That's true. Um, so with all of the endeavors that you have, and we'll talk about them a little bit more, Yale, MIT, the Schwarzman Scholars, the New York Public Library, how do you choose what to focus on? Well, that's, that's a very good question because uh, I'm so busy I'm not doing a lot of choosing. Uh, that what happens is, is people bring me interesting ideas. Uh, you can't do them all. Uh, I like to do things that are transformative, things that create a new patter, paradigm. It, it's sort of like starting little Blackstones uh, again. Uh, it's a familiar uh, type of activity for me, but it's just deployed in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, and I, 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 I like to do something that will change an institution or change the future. Uh, you know, the way the Schwarzman Scholars is, is changing attitudes uh, uh, you know, in, about, uh, in China about the rest of the world, rest of the world to China. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing uh, that's, that's enormously respected both in China and outside. Uh, and the objective there is to create uh, a cadre of future leaders will end up being around 13,000 steady state that can impact the dialogue uh, in the world involving China and the outside world uh, so, so that we have a greater shot uh, at, at peace and um, mu mutual uh, benefit. Uh, and if we can do that, which we will, we're doing it, it's a reality. Um, then that's a wonderful thing uh, as, you know, sort of uh, like a gift uh, to society. And I care about stuff like that. I, I don't do it because somebody tells me. Right. Have you ever thought, Steve, about what really motivates you? I think you said about your father who had a store and did okay, that he was content with what he had and that that sort of struck you as not who you were, that you wanted more. Well, what is it that really drives you then? Well, I, I think it was probably my mother, uh, you know, because we all have like a gene pool and then we all have the environment uh, that we operate in. And, you know, uh, my, my mother was a very positive uh, life force. Uh, and uh, I like uh, the concept of creating things and, and excellence uh, and, and winning. Uh, I've always liked this stuff as, as a kid. Uh, and, and so if you're lucky enough in life, you, you still have the same feelings you do as a kid. Uh, you may modulate them a bit, uh, but, but your personality is intact. I haven't changed that much. And, and so I enjoy uh, creating things. I enjoy something new. I, I enjoy uh, creating uh, excellence and change uh, in a positive way. I read that uh, you ran track in high school, speaking of being competitive when you were younger. 
Um, how did that influence you? And I, I know that you've given to the National Track and Field Organization here. You know, I, I, I loved running. Uh, most of us love things we're good at. Uh, I just happened to inherit it that my dad uh, ran also. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was just wonderful, that idea that you're sort of out there alone testing the limits of what your own capacity is um, uh, and, you know, pushing yourself um, and, and having, you know, great results and being on a team of other people, you know, sort of doing the same thing. Uh, we were sort of fourth in the United States. Mm. It's a big country. Right. Uh, and we were just in one state out of 50 uh, uh, in sort of the mile relay. But I, I got, you know, I, I actually, I, I, I saw a woman on television in the Olympics um, who fell down in the last hurdle uh, when she was ahead. She would have gotten a gold medal. As it worked out, um, she got nothing. And, and you know, it, for an athlete, you know, winning an Olympic gold medal in that sport, that's everything. And, and so I figured she was so depressed, I, I, I invited her to New York uh, to go to the, um, uh, uh, to the US Open Championships and, you know, sort of get her out of what I thought. I didn't know this person, like a funk. Mm -hmm. uh, you, how could you not be? you know, totally depressed uh, and, you know, um, and take her up to see John McEnroe in the, in, in, in the, in the broadcast booth and, you know, just do a nice yeah. thing and get her back and with more confidence uh, for the future. And, and so, so I did that and, uh, and, and she, she told, you know, sort of somebody at the U.S. Track and Field Foundation, they, they came to see me and, um, Say, could you support some of our athletes? I, I said, sure. What, what, what do you need? And, and so now I'm, I'm underwriting 25 of them. Huh. And, and uh, in the last Olympics, I, I think we got, um, I think it was four golds uh, with these athletes, um, uh, three silvers and three bronze, something like that. And, and I've learned that you can't tr train uh, as a track athlete. Um, after you get out of college unless somebody supports you because you need two or three jobs and you have to train twice a day. So you can't do that. Yeah. And, and so the nice thing for me is, is when these great uh, talents say, if, if, if I hadn't had this support, I would have had to quit the sport. Right. And it's, it's my destiny to win, not mine, theirs. And, and you make it possible. Right. Well, that's like, that's like a nice feeling. That must be gratifying. Do you do you get a chance to run at all still? Uh, I'm on the treadmill every morning. Uh, I, I don't like running on an uneven surfaces. As you get older, right. you know, sort of even surfaces are better. Yeah, I excellent. Still out there. Good. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to ask you about. Um, income and wealth inequality. And Ray Dalio recently wrote a long piece about capitalism and why he thought it wasn't working and how to fix it. Uh, one of his solutions um, included higher taxes, uh, and investment also, but higher taxes on wealthy people. What are your thoughts on that subject just generally? Well, I think it's an important subject. Uh, and, you know, I've thought about this uh, a lot because whenever you, 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 you find, you know, some unusual um, uh, things happening in society, uh, uh, th there are reasons. And, and you know, um, wh what I've learned, just independent of Ray, but confirming, um, is, is that about half of the country, uh, two or three years ago, uh, couldn't write a $400 check uh, in an emergency. They live paycheck to paycheck. They have no savings. And their net worth per capita is about the same as the bottom 50% of the population of Greece. Hmm. So within the United States, it's all not the United States. Imagine like we're half the prosperity of people in Greece at the bottom of, of Greek society. That is not what people expect America uh, to do when we have an average GDP per capita around $55,000. So that means some people are making a bunch more and a lot of other people are making less. So the issue is um, 
I don't believe it's, it's, uh, it's tax policy per se, uh, be because we, we have the most progressive, uh, which means graduated, income tax uh, in the developed world. We, we, we have um, one percent uh, of the population paying, depending upon location, uh, 40 to, in New York State, 51 percent mm -hmm. of, of the income taxes. And, and, and so the, the top is paying a lot uh, of, of the taxes, uh, but the system isn't working. And, and I think the, the reason is I would call it uh, income uh, insufficiency uh, for, the, for the bottom 50 percent uh, of the country. And I think it's really important that we solve this problem because you're not going to have a cohesive society if these people cannot participate in it. If they're How not, can we solve it? Well, it's not so hard to solve, actually. It's, it's very much correlated to education. Mm -hmm. At the same time this problem developed, the U.S. went from number one in the world when I was younger, going to public schools, um, to number 35. When you go from number one to number 35, right. something bad right. is going to happen. People won't be able to get quality jobs. Uh, and they don't have training, even if they're, they're not college uh, uh, prepared uh, to do other things. Uh, and there's a whole way of reorganizing education, uh, paying more money to teachers, uh, getting uh, other people in the classroom, the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. We can still read and write. Probably about 15, depends how you measure it, 15 to 30 percent of Americans can't. That's no way right. for these people to progress. And we can educate everybody here. But if you look at where we are at number 35, we're surely not doing it. And we need some type of Marshall Plan to address this issue. Investing in education in the United States. Making education Would you work, work on a plan to do that? Uh, sure, I, I, you know, I've been thinking about things like right. this because, because our country can't deliver the promise that people of my generation had uh, unless we, we dramatically improve. You can have different philosophies of what you think is right, wrong, and so forth. When you go from number one to number 35, right. whatever your philosophy is, if it's being deployed, doesn't work. It's not working. Let me ask you a little bit about um, President Trump. Two questions. Um, first of all, do you think people misunderstand Donald Trump? Geez, that's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, so it, it's hard for me to comment on something like that. I mean, well, let me, okay, let me ask the next question then about his tax policies specifically then. Where do you stand on that? And are you concerned, as some are, that we're increasing deficits and essentially mortgaging the future by cutting taxes and running up the deficit? Well, what I'd say is nobody likes uh, the consequence uh, of, uh, of large deficits. Uh, uh, and the question is, how do you, how do you make the whole thing fit? Uh, you know, one question that the current administration addressed was, was our complete non-competitiveness. Uh, in terms of income taxes for corporations. You, you don't win a job creation race by, by having the top taxes uh, in the developed world for corporate activity. You, you, you should at least be in the middle, if not the most, right. co you know, uh, most competitive. For, if you look, for example, of, of how well Ireland has done with the lowest tax rates, it, it, it doesn't take a big brain to recognize that there, are, that, that, that there is a correlation uh, between low ca taxes and economic uh, activity and employment. And, and, and so that, that's a good thing uh, uh, to do. Uh, but we also need uh, to, to have um, investments uh, uh, in people uh, mm -hmm. that, that correct this uh, problem uh, of the bottom 50%. Uh, it has to be done. 
and, and you know, no one wants to increase taxes uh, uh, unless it's on someone else. But are there social programs, Steve, besides this investment in education that you're talking about that might be required to address that problem? I, I, think, I think you have to find a way, because my conceptualization of this uh, is that it's an income insufficiency problem, uh, is that you f have to find a way to increase the income. Uh, does that mean increasing the minimum wage, for instance? Yeah, I think it does. Uh, so and you're and when, what, what happens if you would do that is you're not just increasing the minimum wage. Minimum wage only applies to 15% of the people in the country. But if you did something uh, in that area, um, uh, that, that it will force up the income for other people in that company. In effect, that's a tax on the business community, isn't it? Right. Uh, and the only reason you would want to accept such a tax uh, is if you actually got a result. Uh, yeah, and and, and you, you, you have to have uh, proof, if you will, uh, not of a concept in general, but how are we going to go from number 35 back up towards number one? Right. I think, and you might be surprised, uh, that if you could make that proof, make that argument, have that plan, that people would say, we got to do something. Well, it sounds like you think that. Um, let me ask you about China a little bit. Obviously, you are an old China hand, or an experienced China hand, I should yeah, say. Yeah, I'm not so old. Okay, right, thank you. Um, but uh, you have the uh, Schwarzman Scholars at Tsinghua and uh, have been um, investing there and understand the country. I think a lot of people agree with President Trump that the old rules that were established when China was very much a developing country, and it no longer is, should be changed. The question is, is he going about it the right way in terms of forcing China's hand? What do you think of the trade dispute, and how do you think it's going to get resolved? Well, I think the trade, result, uh, will, trade issues will, will result in a trade agreement uh, um, you know, in the next two months, um, because both countries think that's uh, important. Uh, how he got there? Uh, is non-traditional. Mm -hmm. um, virtually every other president uh, in, in my lifetime since China was opened by Nixon uh, and Kissinger, and I guess it was 1972, uh, three, um, has failed. Every one of them. Uh, and we're not going to fail this time. We will not get an agreement that covers every issue uh, that, that would be our ask. And the reason for that, of course, uh, is, is that the Chinese system, uh, which you know, uh, do doesn't really make itself um, susceptible of complying with all of those asks. It's a mixed system with a very big government sector uh, in, in their economy uh, and all kinds of different incentives and controls. And, and, and so to wean China off of that system is not about a trade negotiation with a short-term solution for 70 years uh, of, of different uh, uh, evolution and a different fundamental business model than we have uh, in the West. Uh, this is a start. And as China gets more wealthy, um, uh, it'll be easier for them to change. As China manufactures their own intellectual capital, they will want to protect it. Uh, and so I think what we're going to have is, is a very good start, um, but, but you won't get 100% of what you know, some people would say, well, we should get all that. And you're dealing with, with, with a society and structure that doesn't do any of that pretty much. And, and so they'll think they've gone far, will think uh, they've made progress, but it's a start. Uh, and so like most things in American politics, you'll have some divisiveness of that. But if you step back and you say, are we better off with a really good first step, uh, as opposed to whichever previous president you want to pick, uh, that you think is terrific. They accomplished nothing uh, in this area. 
uh, I think the proof of concept, you know, who, who, who could like relate to all of these tariffs? We've never had that uh, at this scale in our lifetimes. Uh, uh, but it apparently did manage to get the attention, uh, which is what it was meant to do. Uh, and I think we'll have a successful outcome if you measure by what is in the possible zone. And that's infinitely better than where we were. What do you say, Steve, to Chinese political leaders? Do you speak candidly to them? I do, yeah. I sort of speak like this. This is my one way of speaking. And, you know, what's interesting about them, and, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to deal with really pretty much all of them, uh, is, is if you tell them what's really happening, what the perception is of what's going on, what likely outcomes are as a result of making no change, which won't be good for them, and, and what, what, what is sort of in the fair and reasonable standard, uh, they're, they're very um, uh, open. Uh, in other words, if you're viewed as somebody who's uh, just operating in the best interests of all parties, in other words, you know, you can't make a deal if you don't know what the other people really want uh, and have any real concept of what's fair because you're coming from different systems. Uh, the, the Chinese haven't had the world's most remarkable economic trans transformation uh, of any society in a 40-year period. I mean, it's, it's amazing what they've done. And they haven't done it because they don't listen. They haven't done it uh, because they're not smart. Right. They are smart, and they just need the, they need the honesty. Right. People tell right. them what's up. And it's up to them to figure it out. Right. Let me ask you about uh, Blackstone a little bit and the business cycle. Um, it's been reported you guys are raising a big fund, $22 billion, the biggest fund on the way to being even bigger, the biggest fund you guys have raised, the biggest since 2007. And when I saw that, I said, uh-oh, does that mean it's the top of the cycle? So where do you think we are in the cycle, and how is Blackstone positioned? Well, that's a really good question, Andy. And, um, you know, the cycle was declared over, I think, uh, in the fourth quarter uh, of um, uh, 2018 last year. And uh, I think everybody was agreed, uh, you know, not, not being you know, self-congratulatory. I thought it was crazy uh, what people were saying. You thought it was crazy when people declared it over? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have about 200 companies and, and, you know, we saw an economic slowing, but we didn't see a recession. No one of our CEOs saw that happening. And so I don't have to be too smart to, to know that's what they think. We, we have uh, uh, at the firm over 100 billion of uh, revenues, 500,000 people working uh, at, our, at our companies. And if, if they are all seeing the world differently uh, than, than, you know, the media, um, I'd bet on them uh, because they're actually there dealing with customers. And, and so I, I think what's happened is global growth has, has softened uh, for sure. You know, uh, China not as soft as you think. Uh, and that was reported. Uh, oh, surprise, surprise. Uh, you know, they, they've stimulated their economy and they're, they're not collapsing. Uh, they'll probably grow around six if you think they aren't performing, you know, reporting accurately, wherever they were is not going down anymore. It's starting to come up. Uh, the U.S. will be, I don't know, two and a quarter, two and a half. Um, and it's Europe, ironically, that's really the problem. Uh, Europe is 25 percent. Why is that ironic? Well, they're so big. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, China's around 15% of the world economy. Europe's 25. Mm. U.S. is around 23. Uh, and to have the biggest engine of the world that nobody talks about. Right. Everybody talks about the United States. Everybody talks about China. Hardly anybody talks about Europe. And Europe is, you know, sort of in a, I don't know whether it's no the growth. The sick man of Europe is Europe. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. And, and so that's what, you know, we're having a slowing, but, right. but, but we're not uh, certainly in the U.S., certainly in China, um, you know, we're, we're not having recessions. And finally, um, Blackstone was founded in 1985. 
Um, it's been a number of years now, Steve, right? Apparently. Yes. So Goldman Sachs, 1869. So, you know, what do you look to do to make this a sustainable institution, and where do you see Blackstone 25 years from now? Yeah, well, Blackstone is a sustainable institution. Uh, you know, we've been here, uh, it'll be 34 years this year. Uh, our flows of capital uh, um, going into the alternative uh, businesses dwarf everybody uh, in our field. Uh, and uh, it's changed uh, the way uh, institutions who give out money uh, uh, allocate. The, the performance of uh, our types of products, just to make it simple for our high performance products are about double the stock market uh, after fees uh, and with uh, almost no loss uh, of individual things, let alone a fund. Right. Uh, and so, uh, and, and this is over decades, not just one little cycle, measurement cycle. And so if you can make, uh, if you have an expectation to make double in one area, why wouldn't you give it funds? And, and so what's happening to the money management uh, industry, it's becoming a barbell where you have on one side of the barbell uh, index funds next to no fees, uh, basically mirroring a market so you can't be criticized and, and, and many active managers underperform. So that's where the money's going there. And on the other side, people need you know, extra return and they're going into the alternatives, whether it's private equity, real estate, um, uh, credit, other types of areas, and, and we're the leader, and, and we uh, intend to, to continue um, uh, expanding where we see something good. We don't expand for the heck of it. We're in the business of giving great uh, ride to our customers. That's the only reason we exist as a business, to do a great job for people to give us money. And we measure ourselves pretty simply uh, are we the best in the world at what we do in that area that we choose to be in? Uh, this is a very easy way to measure yourself. Uh, if you're not, that means you have to improve. Yeah. And, and so at the firm itself, where we've gone through uh, you know, two generations uh, of succession, in effect beyond me, Tony James, who was uh, you know, the president for about 17, 18 years, and now John Gray, uh, and we're very fortunate to have people of uh, who, who reflect the firm's culture and have great talent and people at every position in the, uni in, in, in the firm with the next generation as well. And, and we believe some simple things like don't lose money. Right. If, if you don't lose money for customers and you do really well and you, you, you run your risk to always be protective, then, then you will do a good job. So I... I am extremely optimistic uh, about, about our future. Uh, we just have to not mess it up. And you have to always feel like you're just starting, that you're always at risk, that the world owes you nothing. You have to earn it every day. You're like a basketball player. It doesn't matter what your record is. If you go out and you, you only score 40 points and that's what happens to you, you're not going to win. Fair enough. Steve Schwartzman, CEO of Blackstone Group, congratulations on your success and good luck to you going forward. Thanks, Andrew. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.